San Francisco, extracting the signal from the noise. It's the Cube, covering VMworld 2015. Brought to you by VMworld and its ecosystem sponsors. Now your host, Stu Miniman and Brian Gracely. Welcome back. This is the Cube Silicon Angle TV's live production of VMworld 2015 here in Moscone North, San Francisco. Happy to have back uh, on this segment. We're actually going to dig into some of the networking pieces. Brian Gracely and myself here hosting it. Sean Walsh, uh, repeat Cube guest, uh, you know, uh, in a new role though. So, Sean, right. uh, welcome back. You're now the general manager of the Ethernet business at, at QLogic. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. So, I mean, Sean, you know, we're, we're joking before we start here. I mean, you and I go back about 15 years. We I do. Mean, you know, those that know the adapter business, I mean, you know, J and I, the old J Core yep. business. Um, you, you've worked for QLogic before, yep. you did a stint at Emulex, and, yep. and you're now back to QLogic. So, wh why don't we start off with that? You know, what brought you back to QLogic? What do you see as the opportunity there? Sure. Um, I'll tell you, more than anything else, what brought me back was this 25 gig transition. Uh, it's very rare, and, and I call it the holy trifecta of opportunity. So, you've got a market transition. You actually have a chip ready for the market at the right time, and the number one incumbent, which is Intel, doesn't have a product. I mean, not that they're late, they just don't have a product. And that's the type of stuff that great companies are built out of, are, are those unique opportunities in the market. And you know, more than anything else, that's what brought me back to QLogic. All right, so before we dig into some of the Ethernet and the hyperscale piece, you know, yep. what, what's the state of fiber channel, Sean? You know, we, we said is you know, is fiber channel the walking dead? Is it just <laughs> a cash cow uh, that you know QLogic be able to milk for, in, in brocade and the others in the fiber channel business for a number of years? You know, what, what's your real impression of fiber channel today? Yeah. So you know, look, fiber channel is mature. There's no question about it. Is it the walking dead? No, not by any stretch. And if it is The Walking Dead, man, it produces a lot of cash. So I'll take that any, any, any day of the year. Hey, The Walking Dead's a real popular show, so Fiber Channel you know, is still, still going to be used in a lot of environments. But you know, jokingly, the, the way that I, I describe it to people is I look at Fiber Channel now as the Swiss banking of networks. So a lot of web giants buy our Fiber Channel cards, and people will look at me and go, well, why do they do that? Because for all the hype of open compute and all the hype of the front end processors and all the things that are happening, when you click on something where there's money involved, that's on back-end Oracle stuff and it's recorded on Fiber Channel. And if there's money involved, it's on Fiber. And as long as there's money in the enterprise or in the cloud, I'm reasonably certain Fiber Channel will be around. Yeah, it's a funny story. I remember uh, two years ago, I think we were at Amazon's reInvent show, mm -hmm. and uh, Andy Jassy's on stage, and somebody asked, you know, well, how much of Amazon is running, Amazon.com is running on AWS? And it's most of it. And we all joke that somewhere in the back corner <laughs> running the financials is, you know, a storage area network with a traditional array, yep. you know, probably att attached by Fiber Channel. Absolutely. I mean, we just did a rollout uh, with one of the web giants. And there were six different locations. Uh, each, of the, each of the pods for the servers were about 5,000 servers. And you know, as you would expect, about 3,000 of the front access servers. Uh, there's about 500 for pop cache. There was about uh, 15, you know, maybe 12, 1,300 for the, for the big data and content distribution and all those other things. The last 500 servers looked just like the enterprise. Dual 10 gigs, dual uh, fiber channel cards, and you know, I don't see that changing anytime soon. All right, so uh, let, let's talk a bit a little bit about 25 gig Ethernet. I sure. uh, had, had an interview yesterday with Mellanox actually, who you know had some strong claims about their market leadership in the you know greater than 10 gig space. So where are we with kind of the standards, the adoption, and uh, QLogs position and 25 gig Ethernet? Sure. So you know, obviously, like everyone in this business, we all know each other. Yeah. And when you look at the post 10 gig market, okay, 40 gig's been the dominant technology, and I will tip my hat to Mellanox. They've done well in that space. Now we're both at the same spot. So we have exactly the same opportunity in front of us. We're early to market on the 25. We have a race to get there. And what we're seeing is the 10 gig market is going to 25 pretty straightforward because they like the single cable plant versus the quad cable plant. The people that are at 40 aren't going to 50, they're going to transition straight to 100. We're seeing 50 more as a blade uh, architecture, mid-plane sort of solution. And that's where we're at right now. And, and I can tell you that we have multiple design win opportunities that we're in the midst of, and we are slugging it out with these guys, everything, and it will be an absolute knife fight between us and Mellanox to see who comes out number one in this market. Obviously, we both think we're going to win, um, but 
at the end of the day, I've placed my bet and I expect to win. All right, so Sean, can, can you lay out for us, you know, where are those battles? So traditionally the network adapter, it was an OEM type solution. Right. I, I got it into the traditional server guys yeah. and then it was getting the brand recognition for the enterprise customers and pushing that through. How much is that traditional kind of OEM, is it changing? What's happening in the service providers and the, those hyperscale web giants? Yeah, so there's, there's three fundamental things when you look at 25 gig you got to deal with. So first off, the enterprise is going to be much later because they need the IEEE version that has backwards auto negotiation. So you know, that's definitely a 17, 18, pearly transition type thing. Um, the play right now is in the cloud and the service provider market where they're rolling out specific services and they're not as concerned about the backwards compatibility. So that's where we're seeing the strength in this. So they're all the names that you would expect. And uh, I have to say one of the interesting things about working with these guys is their NDAs are even nastier than our OEM NDAs. They do not <laughs> want you talking about them. But it is very much that market where it's a non-traditional enterprise type of solution for the next 12, 18 months. And then as we roll into that next gen around the Perley architecture, where we all have full auto negotiation, that's where you're going to see the enterprise start to kick in. Yeah, what, what, are, what are the types of applications that are driving this, this next bump in speed? What is it, uh, is it video? Is it sort of east and west types of, of sure. application traffic? Is it big data? What's, what's driving this next bump? So a couple of things you would expect, which would be the, you know, certainly Hadoop, MapReduce, you know, those sorts of things are going there. Uh, the, the beginning of migration to Spark, where they're doing real-time analytics versus post uh, or, or post-processing batch. batch type stuff. So there they really care about it. And this is where RDMA is also becoming very, very popular in it. Um, the next area that most people probably don't think of is the telco in a vSpace, is the volume as these guys are doing their double move and they're going from uh, ATCA type platforms running mostly one in 10, they're going to leap right to 25. And the, for them, the big thing is the ability to partition the network and do that virtualization and be able to run DPDK in one set of partitions, standard storage on another set of partitions, and classic IP on the third. Um, among, the, uh, among the few folks that you, know, you would expect in that are the big content distribution guys. So one of the companies that I can mention is Netflix. So they've already been out, at, they're at 40 right now. And you know, they're not waiting for 50, they're going to make another leap that goes forward and they've been pretty public about those types of statements. Uh, if you look at some of the things that they talked about at NDF, or uh, uh, IDF, and they're wanting to have NVMe and direct DAS connection uh, over ICER, that's driving the 100 gig stuff. Uh, we did a demo at a Flash Memory Summit with Samsung where we had uh, you know, a little over three million IOPS coming off of it. And again, it's not the, the raw number that matters, but it's that ability to scale and deal with that many concurrent sessions that are driving it. So those are the early applications, and I don't think the applications will be a surprise, because they're the, all the ones that have moved to 40. You know, the 10 wasn't enough, 40 might be too much, they're going to 25, and for a lot of the others, and it's really the pop cash side that's driving the 100 gig stuff, because you know, when that Super Bowl ad goes, you got to be able to take all that bandwidth at once. Yeah, so uh, Sean, you brought up NVMe. Maybe can you discuss a little bit, you know, what are the, you know, NVMe and some of these next generation architectures, and what's the importance to the user? Sure. So NVMe is basically a, a connection capability that used to run for hard drives, and then as Intel moved into SSDs, they added this, so you had very, very high performance, low latency, PCI Express-like uh, performance. Um, what a number of us in this business are starting to do is then say, hey, look, instead of using SAS, which is kind of running out of gas at 12 gig, let's move to NVMe and make it a fabric and encapsulate it. So there's three dynamics that help there. One is the advent of 2550-100. The second is the use of RDMA to get the latency that you want. And then the third is encapsulation of uh, ICER or the iSCSI with RDMA together. And it's sort of that trifecta of things that are giving very, very high performance scale out on the back end. And again, this is for the absolute fastest applications where they want the lowest latency. Um, there was an interesting survey that was done by University of Arizona on latency. And it said that if two people are talking, and if you pause for more than a quarter of a second, that's when people change their body language. They lean forward, they tilt their head, they do whatever. And that's kind of the tolerance factor for latency on these things. And again, one of the, one of the statements that, uh, that Facebook made publicly at their uh, recent forum was that they will spend $100 million to save a millisecond. Because that's the type of investment that drives their revenue screen. The faster they get clicks, the faster they generate revenue. So when you think of high frequency trading, when you think of all those things that are time sensitive, um, 
the human factor and that are going to drive this. All right, so uh, storage, storage. And the interaction with uh, networking is you know, critically important, especially Absolutely. at a show like this. Yep. At, at VMworld, um, and I mean, Sean, you and I have talked for years, is it, it wasn't necessarily you know, fiber channel versus the ethernet. No. It's uh, changing operational models. If I exactly. go use Salesforce, uh, I don't think about my network anymore. No, and you if don't. Salesforce happened to use Ethernet, it's I don't really care. Yeah. Um, hyperconvergence, um, when somebody buys hyperconvergence, you right. know, they just kind of the network comes with it. When I buy a lot of these solutions, exactly. my networking decision is made for me and I haven't thought about it. So, yeah. you know, w w what's that trend that you're seeing? So the, for us, the biggest trend is that it's a shift in customer base. So people like Nutanix and these guys are becoming the drivers of what we do. And the OEMs are becoming much more distribution vehicles for these sorts of things than they are the creators of this content. Um, so when we look at how we write and how we build these things, um, there's far more multi-threading in terms of them. There's far more uh, partitions in terms of the environment because we never know when we get plugged into it what that is going to be. So incorporating our L2 and our RDMA into one set of engines so that you always have that high performance on tap, on demand. And you know, without getting down into the minutia of the implementation, um, it is a fundamental shift in how we look at our driver architectures, you know, looking at ARM-based solutions and uh, microservers versus just x86 uh, as we roll the film forward. And it also means that as we look at our architectures, they have to become much smaller and much lighter. So some of the things that we traditionally would have done in an offload environment, we may do more in firmware on the side. And I think the other big trend that is going to drive that is this move towards FPGAs and some of the other things that are out there, uh, essentially acting as co-processors for things. <clears throat> You, you, you mentioned earlier uh, open compute, open compute platform, those, right. those foundations and what's going on. What is, what, what's really going on there? I think a lot of us see the headlines. Uh, sometimes you think about it and you go, okay, this is an opportunity for lots of engineering to contribute to things, but what's the right. reality that you're, you're dealing with the web scale folks. Sure. They seem like the first immediate types of companies that would buy into this or, or use it. What's yep. the reality of what's going on with that space? Well, it, obviously inside the, the I will say the, the web scale cloud giant space. You know, I think right now, if you look at it, you've got sort of the big 10, Baidu, Tencent, Alibaba, a Amazon Web, Azure, Microsoft being those guys. And then, you know, they are definitely building and, and, and designing their own stuff. There's another tier below that where you have the Ebays, the Twitters, the, the other sorts of folks that are in there. And, you know, they're just now starting that migration. Um, if you look at the enterprise, um, not a big surprise, the financial guys are leading this. Yeah. Um, we've seen uh, public statements from uh, JPM and other folks that have been at these events. So, you know, I view it very much like the Blade server migration. Um, I think it's going to be 25% 20, of the overall market. Um, whether, we, whether people like to admit it or not, good old Rack and Stack is going to be around for a very long time. And, you know, there, there are applications where it makes a lot of sense. Um, when you're deploying pro, uh, private cloud in, in the managed service provider market, we're starting to see a move into that. But you know, if you say, you know, what's the 10-year life cycle of an architecture? Um, I would say that in the cloud, we're probably four or five years into it. In the enterprise, we're maybe one or two years into it. All right. So. What about the whole SDN discussion, Sean? You yes. know, how much does QLogic play into that? What are you seeing in, in general? And you know, we're at VMworld, so what about NSX? You know, is that part of the conversation? And what, what do you hear in the marketplace today? Yeah, it really is part of the conversation. And the interesting part is that um, I think SDN's getting a lot of play because of the capabilities that people want. And again, you know, when you look at the managed service providers wanting to have large scale, lower cost, that's going to definitely drive it. But much like OpenStack and Linux and some of these other things, it's not going to be, you know, the guy's going to go download it off the web and put it in production at AT&T. You know, it's going to be a prepackaged solution. It's going to be embedded as part of it. Um, you know, if you look at uh, what Red Hat is doing with their OpenStack uh, release, if you look at what Mirantis is doing with their OpenStack release, again, from an enterprise perspective and from a production in the MSP and second tier cloud, that's what you're going to see more of. So for us, SDN is critical because it allows us to then start to do things that we want to do for high performance storage. It allows us to change the value proposition in terms of, uh, if you look at Hadoop, one of the things we want to be able to do is take the storage engine module 
and run that on our card with our embedded vSwitch in our next gen chip so that we can do zero stack copies uh, between nodes to improve latency. So it's not just having RDMA, it's having a smart stack that goes with it. And having the SDN capability to, to go out, tell the controller, pay no attention to this little traffic that's going on over here. You know, these are not the droids you're looking for. And then everything goes along pretty well. So it's, it's very fundamental and strategic. But it's, it's a game, it's a market in which we're going to participate, but it's not one we're going to try and write um, or, or do a distribution for. Okay, a any other VMware-related activities QLogic's doing, announcements this week that uh, you want to share? Uh, this week I would have to say no. Um, you know, I think the one other thing that we're strategically working on, them on with that you would expect is RDMA capabilities across vMotion, vSAN, those sorts of things. Uh, we've been one of the leaders in terms of doing Genevieve, which is the follow-on to VXLAN uh, for hybrid cloud and that sort of thing. And we see that as a key fundamental partnership technology uh, with VMware going forward. All right, so but let's turn back to QLogic for a second. So okay. uh, uh, the CEO uh, recently uh, left. He did. Uh, and uh, there's a search going on. So give us the company update, if you will. Well, actually, there, there isn't a search. So Gene Hu yeah. okay. um, is going gonna, is gonna to run uh, the ship forward as uh, CEO. Okay. Uh, we've brought in Chris King, uh, who was on our board uh, as executive chairperson. Uh, Chris has a lot of experience in the chip market, and she understands that intimate tie that we have to that Intel TikTok model, and really how you run an efficient chip-driven organization. Um, you know, whether we, we, we play in the systems in between level, you know, where we're not quite the system, but we're not quite the chip, um, and understanding that market is part of what she does. And the board has given us the green light to continue to go forward, develop what we need to do in terms of uh, the other pieces. Jean has a strong financial background. She was acting CEO for a year uh, between HK and, and Simon, or should be after Simon uh, left. So she's got the depth, she knows the business. And for us, you know, um, you know, it's kind of a non-op where everything else is continuing on as you would expect. Yeah, okay, I, I, the last question I have for you, Sean. I mean, the dynamics change. For years, sure. uh, you know, there was kind of the duopolies in the market. I mean, it was Intel and Broadcom. Oh, yeah. On, on the Ethernet side, it was Emulex and, and, and yeah. QLogic. Uh, it's a different conversation today. I mean, you, you mentioned Intel, we talked about Mellanox, there's oh, yeah. QLogic, uh, you know, your old friends Broadcom's at Emulex. Broadcom's coming back. Um, you have, uh, Avago bought Broadcom, and now they're called Broadcom, I think. So, yeah, so you know, so. lay off for us, you know, kind of, you know, where you see the, the, the horses on the track and, uh, you know, what excites you. Yeah. Um, so again, you know, if you look at the, the 10 gig side of the business, clearly Intel has the leadership position right now. Uh, we're number two in the market. Um, if you look at the share data that's come out, you know, the, the, the Emulex part of, of Avago uh, has been struggling uh, and losing share. Um, then we have this 25 gig transition that came in the market. And that was driven by Broadcom. And you know, for those of us who have followed this business, they, I think everyone can appreciate the irony of Avago, of Avago buying Emulex. And then for all the years we tried to keep them separate, bringing them back together was, uh, we, we, we've chuckled over a few beers on that one. Um, but then you've got this 25 gig transition. And you know, the other thing is that if you look at, so, so let me step back and, and say the other thing on the 10 gig market is it was a very, very clear dividing line. The enterprise was owned by the Broadcom slash QLogic Emulex side. The cloud, the channel, the, the, the appliance business was owned by Intel Mellanox, okay? Now as we go into this next generation, you've got us, Mellanox, and the, 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 the original Broadcom team coming in with 25 gig. We've all done something that gets us through this consortium approach. We're all gonna have an IEEE approach from there, and Intel isn't there. Um, you know, we haven't seen any announcements or anything specific from Emulex uh, that they've said publicly in that space. So right now, we kind of view it as a two-horse race. We think from a software perspective that our friends at, Avo at, at Broadcom, Broadcom, whatever we want to call them, or, or Bravago, I think is how uh, our CTO refers to them, uh, that I don't think they have the software depth uh, to, to run this playbook right now. Um, and then what we have to do is take our enterprise strength and move those things like load balancing and failover and the SDN tools and NPAR and all the, the virtualization capabilities we have, we got to move those rapidly into the, into the cloud space and go after it. Uh, for us, it means we have to be more open source driven than we have been in the past. Uh, it means that we have a different street fight for every one of these. Uh, it represents a change in some of the sales model and in, in how we go to market. 
So, you know, not to say that we're, you know, we, we've got all the, everything wrapped up and perfect in this market, but again, right time, right place, and this will be the transition for another, you know, we think three to five years. Um, and there's, there's still a lot of interesting things that are happening. Ironically, one of the most interesting things I think that's gonna happen in 25 is this use of the, uh, of the new um, little profile connectors. I think that will do more to help the adoption of 25 gig and 100 gig where you can use the RCX or RxC connector. There's RCX or RxC, I forget the acronym. Um, but it kind of looks like the Firewire uh, HDMI connectors that you have on your laptops now. And now imagine that you can have a car that has that connector in a form factor that's you know maybe a half inch square, and now you've got incredible port density, and you can dynamically change between 25, 50, and 100 on the fly. Yeah. Well, well Sean, Sean, you know we've always talked. There's a lot of complexity that goes in under the covers, yes. and it's the industry's done a good job of making that simple and consumable, right. uh, and, and help drive those new textures forward. All right, Sean, thank you so much for joining us. We'll be right back with lots more coverage, including uh, some more networking in-depth conversation. Uh, thank you for watching. Thanks for having me.